Sonali is the host and executive producer of Uprising, a daily drive time radio program at KPFK Pacifica in Los Angeles. She is also a columnist at truthdig.com and a co-director of the Afghan Women's Mission, a nonprofit organization that works in solidarity with Afghan women. She is the author of Bleeding Afghanistan, Washington Warlords and the Propaganda of Silence. Sonali has a master's degree in astrophysics from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Her talk today is titled, My Journey from Astrophysicist to Radio Host, or How I Find Meaning in My Life. Let's give a warm welcome to Sonali Kulpatko. The American Declaration of Independence tells us that we have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Indeed, happy is something that we all want to be, right? Happy is something that we all aspire for. We all want to have our needs met. But is pursuing happiness good for us and for our society as a whole? I say that pursuing happiness is actually not good for us as individuals, nor will we make the world a better place. Now, if we agree that an ideal society is one where everyone has a right to say how their lives are run, then it isn't happiness that we ought to be pursuing. Rather, it is meaning. A meaningful life is not necessarily a happy life, but it is still more important for us to pursue meaning rather than happiness. And I want to tell you my story of how I came to that conclusion. 14 years ago, I had an epiphany. Um, I was working at Caltech at the Spitzer Science Center. I just got my master's degree in astrophysics, and all I wanted to do at that point was to get my PhD and become a research scientist, publish papers. And um, I was sitting at my desk at work one day at Caltech, and I got this email that was forwarded to me that detailed the horrific abuses that Afghan women were going through under these, this uh, misogynist regime called the Taliban, how they were banned from going to school or getting education uh, and uh, health care, going to work, how they were forced to cover themselves from head to toe. I didn't believe it. So I did my own research. And I found out that indeed what was happening in Afghanistan, according to this email, was true. Afghan women were suffering horrific abuses under this regime called the Taliban. And it shocked me. Now, this was not the moment of my epiphany. I also found out that Afghan women were bravely fighting back. An intrepid organization called the Revolutionary Association of the Women of Afghanistan, or RAWA, were organizing underground schools right under the noses of the Taliban. They were digitally documenting what the Taliban was doing. One of their images in particular struck me. And it was this horrible image of a woman in Kabul Stadium on her knees being shot to the head, summarily executed. And the woman who captured this image did it secretly behind her burqa. That there existed such courage in the world shocked me. These were ordinary women just like me. If they didn't have the opportunity to escape this oppression, they only had two choices, either live under it or fight back. And that's exactly what they were doing. They were fighting back nonviolently using education as a weapon. And their courage, not historic or abstract, but here and now, shocked me. And that was my epiphany. So what do you think I did? I left work and I went down the street to a cafe. I ordered a cup of very strong coffee and I cried. I cried. Here I was, a 25-year-old, very well-educated, but clearly not very well-informed young woman living a life of relative privilege. And all I had done up until that point, all I cared about up until that point was astronomy. You know, my specialty was cosmology, uh, which is understanding the origins of the universe, little, little things like that. Um, now, don't get me wrong. It is so important. It sounds really exciting, right, the origins of the universe. And bless astronomers for wanting to unlock the secrets of the universe. I'm married to one of them, and I get it. But for me, doing astronomy meant sitting in front of a computer eight hours a day and writing code. I was bored. I wanted to do something more with my life now that I'd seen these women. Here were these women who were doing such incredibly uh, amazing things. Here were these women fighting for the most basic rights, the right to an education. They wanted to live in a democracy. Why wasn't I helping them? Okay, this was what was going through my head. Why wasn't I helping them? So I did. I emailed them. And 
they wrote back in a testament to the kinds of instantaneous connections that the internet enables us today. They wrote back and within a few months, I was helping organize their first nationwide tour of Rawa in the United States to tell Americans what was happening in Afghanistan and to tell them uh, also what Rawa was doing to fight against it. I uh, helped start a nonprofit organization with the help of other supporters of Rawa called the Afghan Women's Mission, where we funded healthcare projects for women and girls and started schools and uh, literacy projects. I started reading about what was happening in Afghanistan, trying to understand why that was happening there. I started writing about it and speaking about it. And although I didn't know it at the time, it was actually my first real foray into journalism. And then, the Twin Towers and the Pentagon were struck in one of the worst terrorist attacks in US history. And while it was a terrible time for the country, it was also a terrible time for the women of Rawa who realized that the same forces they had been fighting against had now struck the United States. Okay, and so nobody understood what was really happening in Afghanistan at the time to understand why those attacks had happened. They hadn't been paying attention to Afghanistan before 9-11. So I began getting a lot of speaking invitations. I was asked to speak at community forums and on panels and in colleges. I uh, got a lot of media interviews and it was at one um, interview or one event where I was speaking that a friend of mine approached me. She'd just seen me speak and she said, you know, Sonali, you should be on the radio. You should get a job at our local radio uh, station, community radio station KPFK. I thought she was joking. Uh, I even remember laughing slightly hysterically at the notion of me on the radio. <laughs> but she planted a seed. You know, I was still working at Caltech. I was still spending eight hours a day writing code and so much was going on in the world at the time and I felt that I needed to be doing more. So I did something that only a young person with no kids who doesn't have much debt and who's living during a boom rather than a recession has the luxury of doing. I quit my job. I quit my job at Caltech and I showed up at KPFK, resume in hand and asked them to hire me to do a job that I had never done before. All right, well, the gods of right place and right time happened to be smiling down upon me, and they asked me to try out for their morning show because their host was about to leave with very little notice. I tried out, they liked me, I stayed, and it's been 12 years that I have been a broadcast journalist at a community radio station, and actually soon to be cable television. Being a journalist allows me to explore solutions to problems. It allows me to shine a light on issues that affect our community. It allows me to ex ex uh, expose corporate malfeasance uh, and to highlight political doublespeak. You know, I believe that the role of a journalist is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And in this work, I found meaning. In this work, I found meaning. So today, I work a lot harder than I did when I was at Caltech. I don't even get paid as much as I did when I was at Caltech. And now I have two kids, so I actually need that money so much more than when I worked at Caltech. I have little free time. Um, I have very little disposable income. Am I happy? Honestly, most days, I'm depressed. I'm depressed about the state of the world. I'm depressed because every time I have to research a story, I have to come face to face with the horrors that people are going through in their lives. Horrors like this. Iraqi men being degraded at Abu Ghraib. Like this one. A young woman in Iran shot to death on the streets while protesting. Or a young black man shot in the back on a train station in Oakland. And it's traumatizing. I want to look away. I really do, I want to look away, but will looking away mean the horrors stop existing? You know, blissful ignorance can be such a wonderful thing, like a drug, but just as I couldn't turn my back away from the image of this woman in Kabul Stadium who was being summarily executed, I cannot and I will not turn away now because turning away means turning our backs on our fellow human beings. So no, I am not happy, except maybe when I have a glass of wine after dinner <laughs> every night to try to forget about the day's work. And besides, happiness is overrated. It is.
There have been so many studies done on happiness, right? On whether being happier makes you a better employee or whether being married makes you, uh, you know, happier in life. Uh, there haven't been as many studies done on the effects of meaning, on the impact of meaning in your life, but they're starting to be. There was one study that was done recently at Stanford where researchers assessed a group of people for uh, the impact of happiness versus meaning in their life. And it turns out they're quite distinct. Uh, there's not as much overlap as you might expect. So one of the uh, conclusions that they came to was happiness was linked to being a, a taker rather than a giver, whereas meaningfulness went with being a giver rather than a taker. So that's fairly obvious, right? And one of their other conclusions was highly meaningful lives encounter lots of negative events and issues which can result in unhappiness. So why would you want to lead a meaningful life if it means making you unhappy? Well, here's one selfish reason. Apparently, at least according to a couple of studies that have just been done, leading meaningful lives might actually make you a healthier person. So there was one study that was just completed that looked at a number of people, a big pool of people, and they looked at two different kinds of happinesses that mirror the kind of happy versus meaning that I've been talking about. One, the researchers called hedonic happiness, the pursuit of pleasure and self-gratification. So the kind of happy you feel when you go out partying and drinking, or, or how you feel when your favorite sports team wins. Uh, satisfying the pleasure impulse. The other they looked at was called eudaimonic. They called it eudaimonic happiness, the pursuit of a selfless, meaningful life. So the kind of happy you feel when you've just volunteered at a soup kitchen or just finished a voter registration drive, uh, when you feel like your life has purpose. And what they found was that people who had high levels of hedonic happiness actually have high levels of genetic markers associated with chronic diseases. Whereas people who had high levels of eudaimonic happiness, who had civically engaged purposeful lives, had favorable gene expressions. Okay, there's another study being uh, done right now at the University of Wisconsin with a much larger pool, uh, 7,000 adults, that's essentially coming to the same conclusion that people with high levels of eudaimonic happiness tend to be healthier uh, or tend to have a, a higher uh, or lower risk factors of disease. So this goes against conventional wisdom, right? Uh, we imagine that the wealthy socialite has a much healthier and longer life than the poor working class activist. Oops. Than the poor working class activist. This is the, the, the conventional wisdom. But in fact, the working class activist may, if these studies are true, be more likely to live a healthier and a longer life. The problem with the uh, a goal to have a, hell, a more meaningful life is that our society is just not very um, attuned to encouraging us to do that, right? We live in a culture that's steeped in the myth of the self-made man, the, the uh, person who lifts themselves up by their bootstraps and makes something of themselves. And that something is usually starting a business or winning an election. We don't value as much those qualities that involve sacrificing for other people. In our culture, the, uh, the hero is uh, the CEO or the hedge fund manager, or, but not the nurse or the teacher or the community activist. We celebrate the virtue of selfishness, and that has to change. The other thing that we uh, come up against is this uh, idea that we don't really want to engage ourselves in things that matter, civically engage ourselves. Um, you know, most of us are scared of serving on a jury, right? You get that jury duty notice and it scares the crap out of us. That's the most basic form of civic engagement, maybe second to voting, and most of us don't even do that. But um, we also don't like to talk about important things at the dinner table. I mean, if we can't talk about religion or politics at the dinner table, what else is there worth talking about? If we as a society are afraid to take on the issues and the things that really matter, what is the point of living in a democracy, right? After all, these women, the women of Rawa, were fighting for the right to live in a democracy. Now, ours is far from perfect, but the avenues that we have to express ourselves, to agitate for change, to call for change are much greater than what somebody living in Afghanistan might have. And using those avenues of change is one way in which we can find meaning in our lives. It's what I was lucky enough to be able to do as a journalist, to be able to uncover the truth, to amplify the voices that are rarely heard. The question is, 
what can all of us do, right? That feeling that you get when you do meaningful work, it's an amazing feeling. We've all felt it at one point or another in their lives, and I know you want to feel it too. And I know you probably have felt it in your lives at some point or another. Nurses and teachers and doctors, they know this feeling. Union organizers know this feeling. We all know this feeling. How do we incorporate it? That's the question. How do we incorporate it into our daily lives? How do we incorporate meaning into our daily lives, especially how do those of us who have privilege, skin color privilege, gender privilege, wealth privilege, educational privilege, how do those of us who have privilege incorporate meaning into our daily lives? Well, the answer is we do something. No matter how big or small, we do something, right? If you're white, fight for racial justice. If you are a citizen, fight for immigrant rights. If you are rich, fight for the rights of the poor. If you are an adult, fight for the rights of children. If you're able-bodied, fight for the rights of the disabled. Do something, no matter how big or small. Incorporate meaning into your life on a day-to-day -day basis. Just as the doctor tells you to incorporate exercise into your life, now that we know that a meaningful life is good for our health, if those studies are true, incorporate meaning into your life because it's not just good for you as an individual, it is good for our planet, it's good for our community. It is so important for us to do that. So do something, live a meaningful life, right? Even if living a meaningful life may not necessarily make you happy. Marcus Garvey once said, the ends you serve that are selfish will take you no further than yourself, but the ends you serve that are for all in common will take you into eternity. Do something, anything that is meaningful in your life, right? Will the pursuit of meaning make you a happier person? I don't know, maybe not. But when I think of that woman in Kabul Stadium, and when I think of the woman who was filming her and what she was fighting for, it is the right to live in a democracy, something that we all have, but most of us take for granted. It is the right to live a meaningful life, something that we can all do, but not enough of us do it. And it is the right to make our world a better place. Will living a meaningful life make you happier? Probably not. And that is okay. Give me life, liberty, and the pursuit of meaning. Thank you.